ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C. In the retirement ceremony for Lieutenant General Robert R. Puark, United States Marine. Please rise for the invocation which will be delivered by Father Willis R. Foster from the St. Stephen Episcopalian Church and remain standing for the playing of our national anthem. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Author of life and to everything you have given a season, calling each thing good in its time. We thank you for our sister Chris, for you and her have been the foundation that Robert has stood on and has made him successful for all these years and it will make him be a success for many more years in all these lives to come. In the years of our lives, you call us to work, you ask us to play, you command us to rest, and you weave our days together in your love. We pray for our brother Robert, who comes to the end of his season of work in our beloved Paul. He has turned his sword to make turned in his sword to make war no more. Open his eyes to the path you now lay before him. Open his ears to hear your word. Open his heart to your love. And help him now to let, go, let the old work go and to take up the new life for which you have already given him gifts. All this we pray in your name, whose love is our eternal rest and joy. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to have as our retired retirement official, the fifth secretary of Homeland Security, the Honorable John F. Kelly. Now joining the Secretary of Homeland Security is Lieutenant General Robert R. Ruhr. Attention to orders. Defense Distinguished Service Medal to Robert R. Ruark. Lieutenant General Robert R. Ruark, United States Marine Corps, distinguished himself by exceptionally distinguished service as military deputy. Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness from April 2015 to June 2017. General Ruark's leadership resulted in major contributions to highly complex personnel and policy matters, impacting service members, veterans, family members, survivors, and Department of Defense civilians. He flawlessly directed a 60-day readiness review with the military departments and the joint staff that determined readiness priorities. General Rurak, progressive actions on flag officers' issues, three-star program reviews, and the quarterly readiness reports to Congress ensured personnel and readiness was positioned to provide critical support to the warfighter. His superior communication skills, insight, experience, and willingness to collaborate made him a trusted mentor and confidant for all members of the armed forces and for senior civilian personnel. This distinctive accomplishment of General Ruark's culminate a long and distinguished career in the service of his country and reflect great credit upon himself, the United States Marine Corps, and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. From Commandant of Marine Corps to Lieutenant General Robert R. Ruark, United States Marine Corps. Subject, release from active duty and transfer to the retired list. On 1 June 2017, 
you were transferred to the Marine Corps Officers Retirement. At 2359 on 31 May 2017, you were detached from your present duty station and be released from active duty. As of 31 May 2017, you will complete 36 years and 11 days of active service. Signed, Robert B. Neller, General, United States Marine Corps. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Secretary of Navy, a national instance is now being presented to Lieutenant General Ruark in honor of his over 36 years of honest, dedicated, and faithful service to our Corps and our nation. Be it known that this flag was flown at the Marine Corps War Memorial. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. A letter from the Secretary of Defense. Dear Bob, congratulations on your retirement, Marine Corps. After 36 years of stellar service to our nation, thank you for your decades of commitment and dedication. You have honorably held many crucial positions in your career, including your most recent assignment, as a military deputy to the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. As you reflect on your career, consider the crucial period in which you served. Our nation's military responded firmly and professionally in the global war against terrorism who attacked our cities. At the same time, we stood by our allies, <coughs> reassuring populations around the world. Without patriots like you willing to serve through times good and bad, our nation could not have withstood the challenges of our era. Your numerous deployments and the leadership which you led each of your commands embody this truth. The price of freedom is high, and you have willingly borne it with great skill. Throughout, you have set a high standard for professionalism and service, and served America with great distinction and honor. You have been an exemplary Marine, and a pleasure to serve alongside in war and peace. Modest, sharp, and hardworking, you have been an inspiring example of hard work and perseverance to all of us in the Naval Service. Thank you for your distinguished service, and I wish you and your delightful lady all the best as you open up a bright new chapter. Signed, Semper Fi, James N. Mattis. Certificate of Appreciation. The Commandant of the Marine Corps takes pleasure in presenting this certificate to Christine A. Cousy in grateful appreciation of your unselfish, faithful, and devoted support of your husband's military career. Your continuous encouragement and understanding help to make possible Robert's lasting contribution to the Marine Corps. We fully realize that your perseverance and understanding were not provided with that hardship and sacrifice during his tour of duty. Signed, Robert B. Neller, General, United States Marine Corps, Commandant of the Marine Corps. Dear Chris, as Bob retires from the active ranks of our Marine Corps, Darcy and I send our congratulations and thank you for your faithful support of his career and for the great sacrifices you have made over his years of service to our nation. More importantly, thank you for your willingness to also serve both in uniform and as a Marine spouse. Darcy and I fully appreciate the sacrifice that comes with marrying a Marine. And you have shouldered that responsibility with also achieving an impressive career as a physician's assistant. As you and Bob bring this chapter of your lives to a close, we hope you will, you will both reflect fondly on all you have accomplished together through the deployments, PCS moves, and the long hours Bob spent away from home. You have withered the challenges military families face with grace. We greatly appreciate your service as a Marine and in our contributions even since leaving our active ranks. As you begin this new chapter in your life, Know that our Corps is forever grateful for your faithful service. Darcy and I wish you and Bob all the best in the coming years. Sincerely, Robert B. Neller, General, United States Marine Corps, Commandant of the Marine Corps. I won't even try to go through the, uh, the list of people who are here to honor uh, Bob and Chris as they go over the side for one last time. Uh, I have to acknowledge the Commandant of the Marine Corps, of course, uh, uh, and, uh, and certainly Bob's family and friends that are here today, his sister and others. Mom, 
that are here today. Uh, Mother-in-law, actually, I'm sorry, that are here today. Um, I would just uh, offer a couple of things. You know, one of the we were talking over in the uh, in the uh, in the Senate House a few minutes ago, and unfortunately, I guess the bar was an open commandant, so uh, we had to change that rule. But uh, I actually met Chris long before I ever met Bob. Chris, when I worked in Capitol Hill some years ago. I would do a lot of overseas congressional delegations, and uh, almost always uh, the spouses would come. Almost always they were female, so I always needed a uh, a, uh, a reliable female officer or NCO to come with me uh, to kind of shepherd them around. Uh, and uh, we always issued a cattle prod to whoever came to make sure the spouses were on time. And, uh, but anyways, uh, Chris came on board. I contacted. Uh, she was at the basic school at the time. She was a captain. I contacted the. Uh, to the basic school, and, and every time I, I need an officer uh, of her quality and uh, frankly her gender uh, to come up and, and go on the trip. So I actually met Chris long before I ever met Bob. Uh, I would just offer this quick story to you as a uh, as a spouse, uh, Chris. Uh, I did uh, recently retired uh, after 45 plus years in the U.S. military. I think I lost 600. My wife knows exactly how many days I lost. 641 days, I think, in my career. Uh, leave not taken. Uh, and all the rest of it that goes with that. And again, my wife knows all of it because she used to badger me about not taking leave or whatever. But the point is, uh, 45 and a half years, I retire on the 1st of February. Uh, fast forward uh, eight months, I think, to uh, right after the election, I get a call uh, from, uh, uh, from someone who claimed to be Reince Priebus, whose name uh, I, I know I still uh, uh, miss, miss uh, Mispronounced, but in any event, once he convinced me it really was Reince Priebus on the phone, he said the uh, the president-elect would really uh, like you to join the team. And uh, of course, this is after uh, the usual promises you make to your spouse. You made these, Bob and Chris. Look, <laughs> if you let me stay in the Marine Corps until I'm done, I will uh, settle any way you want me to settle. I'll buy you the house you've always wanted, and I'll just be at your beck and call any time to do anything you want. And uh, so that's the promise I certainly made with my wife, Karen. And uh, so now I get this phone call a week after the election about joining the uh, Trump team. Uh, don't know him, don't know how he got my name. It was a completely cold call. But at the end of that, I hung up and uh, my wife, I said to my wife, uh, this is uh, an offer to join the administration. Uh, and of course, her response was, uh, well, uh, like all of our families in the Marine Corps, we live a life of service as both individuals as, as well as our families. Uh, she said, we don't know any other thing in the Kelly family but service to the nation, so uh, you got to do it. She says, besides, I'm really tired of all of this quality retired time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got to know Bob more than, more than uh, uh, his reputation and, and certainly as we, him as a man, as a Marine. When we worked together in Iraq, he was the uh, logistics I had a logistics effort in the uh, MNFW uh, effort in the Anbar province. And the one thing that struck me, in, in addition to just his professionalism and his abilities to uh, relate to troops, of any service, his ability to lead, uh, was it seemed every single time when I get up uh, every morning and hear that there was a one of our logistics convoys that drove all over Anbar province, usually at night, any time I'd hear that one of them had been hit, uh, whether disastrously, disastrously was loss of life or simply been hit by an IED or a small arm attack, every single time they'd mention, oh, by the way, General Rourke was uh, on that convoy. He didn't need to be on that convoy, but he was with his troops all the time in the most dangerous places because that's where you know we live as Marine leaders, regardless of what rank you are. And it's also where Bob, uh, Bob Rourke spent most of his time. If there was some issue on Takata or some logistics base somewhere, a violent issue, a violent uh, attack of some type, mortars or whatever, Bob would always be there. He was out and about, I don't know when he rested, but I would tell you this, every single person in the MLG knew who Bob Roth was, knew they had a, a, a leader of, of incredible capabilities and someone who just simply really cared. Uh, that's the Bob Roth I got to know in Iraq and the lead up to Iraq and of course after that, uh, in my time, uh, certainly in, in the joint billets I was in, it seemed every time there was uh, work to be done, Bob Wolf and the joint staff within the Marine Corps staff was brought in to do that. Uh, so that's the man we, we see go over the side with this lady for the last time today. I'll tell you, Bob, as you, as you go to do that, I can tell you what you won't miss. 
uh, you won't miss uh, signing the uh, condolence letters to Marines and sailors and others that have fallen under your command. You won't miss going to the funerals at Arlington and other places that we've all done these last 15 years. You won't miss any of that. But I can tell you what you will miss. You will miss the brotherhood, sisterhood of your fellow general officers and sergeants, majors, and master gunnery sergeants. You will miss the colonels and the lieutenant colonels and the majors uh, and the gunnies and the, and the first sergeants and the master sergeants. You will miss them desperately. Uh, you will miss uh, the youngsters, most of all, uh, the nothings up through NCO who do all of the work, who without hesitation go outside the wire and do the nation's work in combat or simply show up early and go home late in the Pentagon or in Quantico and work, all of us, who work Christmas morning, late at night on, on New Year's Eve and just make this nation what it is. The finest young men and women on the planet, the 1%, you will miss them desperately. So with that, Bob, I would just tell you, and those are the things I miss. You don't realize it till you go over the side and you look back at it. You don't miss the pomp and circumstance as much. You certainly don't miss, as they say, all the uh, shakers. And, you, know, you won't miss that other side of it, but you will miss the men and women who wear the uniform. Uh, so when you take it off for the last time, think about that. You put it on your, on your uh, cover with plastic and put it on your mantle or in your closet or something like that. Just remember that uh, uh, my words here today, because it is the best part of my life for 45 and a half years, the best part of my life, um, was serving this nation in uniform, and especially being a United States Marine. So Bob, with that, um, enjoy for the rest of the day wearing that uniform, uh, and you do take it off, remember that uh, what you have done in the last 36 years and 11 days uh, has made our country safer. And just also remember the tens of thousands, really, young people, most of them from our, our working class, a lower, lower middle class, who came to our Corps or to the Navy and served with us, uh, who came for many, many different reasons, but because of who you are and how you led them and the care you gave them, uh, you sent them back into civilian society, much better men and women. Uh, that's, a, that's an amazing thing to think about, so I'll leave you just with that thought. You've done it all, you and Chris. Uh, you'll continue doing it all. I get some thoughts about your future employment. Uh, but in the meantime, enjoy the day. And uh, one last time, Senator Davis. And one thing you don't ever want to do is follow General Kelly in the speech. And uh, the only advantage I had on this one is he just got back from Saudi Arabia after an overnight trip. So I think he came back at midnight. So it was very, very kind of him and generous, as he always was um, and is, to come do this one. Secretary Kelly, Commandant, uh, Mr. Estevez, Mr. Levine, uh, Mr. Curta, Lieutenant General, at Mac, it's great to have you here today. I know you're the busiest man in the Marine Corps. Um, and uh, Major Generals, Brigadier Generals, and Senior Executive Service. Uh, we got the Chief of Staff of the Marine Corps here, General Asher, and we also have former Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Kent here. So that is a real pleasure to have you here today. Um, but, uh, <coughs> There's a reason I asked you to do this today, sir, and uh, just as there is for the audience that's here today. And everyone in the audience is a personal acquaintance of mine. That's why I asked to do it in here and not on the parade field. Um, it's very personal, and uh, it includes my, from my sister who's here uh, to my hometown friends from Salem, Ohio, to someone from nearly every assignment in the Marine Corps is in this room today. Um, for Secretary Kelly, it was working for him as one of his commanding generals for about 18 months of preparation and deployment to Iraq. For me, it was operating solely on his commander's intent, which was using his guidance and vision for Iraq for the 13-month deployment where we ensured a safe transition of security of the entire province, which was the size of North Carolina, to them. So in retrospect today, there are a lot of people, some here, some not here, that really helped shape me, just as General Kelly did when I was a young Brigadier General. Um, my dad recently passed away a couple of months ago, and when I went and visited him in a home just before he died in February, I spoke to a lot of folks there that knew him, and uh, thinking about folks that had influence on me. And uh, everyone I talked to said, you know, uh, your dad was a fighter pilot. And I was thinking, a fighter pilot? He was only a fighter pilot for four years. And uh, he was a 
He worked for the A&P grocery chain. He was a uh, meat plant manager for like 10 years. He was a poultry plant manager as well. And he was a warehouse, ran a warehouse for years. And then his last eight years in, uh, of his working age, he was a Baskin Robbins store um, franchise owner. He owned a store and operated with my mom in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And he said, no, he, he was a fighter pilot. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, said, you know, hey, I understand that, but you know, hey, being all this stuff, no, no, you, your dad was a fighter pilot there, son. So, okay, so my dad was most happy flying, and, uh, and, but he only did it for four years, and I never really understood why until he got dementia, and when I was able to talk to him and ask him why, he would never tell me. And, uh, and essentially, uh, one of the things that dad told me when he had dementia was that uh, when he was in the 20th fighter wing in the, during the four years he was in Europe, um, his wingman was an Air Force uh, lieutenant by the name of George Bud Day. Now, in the Marine Corps, that may not, they may, people not, may not recognize that name, but uh, there's some Air Force generals in the audience today who can tell you who Bud Day is. And Bud Day is the chesty puller of the Air Force. Obviously the most decorated. He's got the two senior awards of the Company of Medal of Honor and, the, and I believe it's the Air Force Cross. But that was his wingman. And Dad never really told me that until got to mention. It was just very interesting. And so while well, I had him on the on a roll there when he was on the mention, sometimes I'd never come back. You know, I asked him, I said, Dad, why don't you stay in the Air Force? You love flying. And uh, you know, it's and you told me when you had, had 20 years in as a career when I was in eighth grade, and then you told me when you had 30 if you stayed in and and the two biggest mistakes of your life were getting out of the Air Force and not flying for the uh, commercial airlines. And he told me finally and he said, you know, I never would have been home. And I wanted to be home to raise a family. But I often think that if he wasn't home, I probably would never join the Marine. You know, it, was, it was his influence, it was his, his being there. And so for me, it was, uh, it was really quite an experience. Now, of course, when I tell the story about him flying with George Bud Day, um, the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Goldfield, who was my, my last boss on the Joint Staff, it's the, first, it's the only time I've ever seen him, fingers, as we call him, um, he, silent. He couldn't talk. He was dumbstruck. He said, Flew with Bud Day. Yeah, he flew with Bud Day. Like Justin Buller of the Air Force. So, but, uh, but anyway, that was just a, that's probably why I, you know, he had the most influence on me and anybody. Um, as well, my sister Kim is here today, and uh, Kim set the bar very high. I could never achieve that bar. In fact, in, uh, she had straight A's, and she was a great athlete and uh, very active as a cheerleader. And uh, she got the letters from West Point and uh, the Naval Academy in 1976 when I, not me, it was interested in the military, but, but my sister got them. And she just tossed them away in the trash can. And uh, so, but she set that bar high, and not until she actually left for college that I finally realized it was time to start squaring myself away, which was my senior in high school. So it was, uh, she's here, she recently retired from industry. She's here with her husband, Pat. Pat is a, uh, a uh, very accomplished person, but I want you to know that he was a Marine in Vietnam, in Quezon. And the first question when I met Pat 20 years ago, he asked me was, so, um, do you know Brian Fagan? I said, Brian Fagan? Oh, yeah. I was a, I think I'd been in 20 years at that point. And uh, I said, Brian Fagan was my first battalion commander in two, second battalion, third Marines in Hawaii, where I kind of grew up in the Marine Corps. And uh, he was a fantastic leader. He was heavily decorated wounded several times, and a shot through the mouth in Vietnam. And it turns out that Pat was in, K in Quezon, um, he was his operations chief as a, probably the only Marine with a college degree who was, <laughs> who was uh, serving as a you know, last corporal or corporal, but as operations chief in the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, which was in some pretty heavy combat um, in Quezon. So I, obviously I immediately connected to Pat, and it's great to have him here today too. Uh, my mother-in-law, Althea, is here. Um, and she is still kicking very well at age 86. We took her out to uh, dinner the other night for her birthday. And, her, and my sister-in-law, Allie, is here. Uh, Allie's got a confirmation hearing today. She's a rear admiral about to retire from the Navy, but she's dressed for the confirmation hearing, which goes on for to be the deputy of the Small Business Administration here today. So keep, my, keep your fingers crossed on that one. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my mother-in-law. So as the monitor, I sent my wife, who was a lieutenant, and the, I was the detailer. I sent her to Okinawa in 1990 for a year. The theory being that we could marry up somewhere on the East Coast when I finished my tour at Headquarters Marine Corps. So um, Althea lived in Richmond with her husband, uh, Frank. And uh, we were courting, and then Althea said, hey, listen, I got a deal for you. You just, you can't refuse. 
if you come down here for the weekends in, in Richmond, um, I'll put you to work for uh, room and board. I said, what? <laughs> so her uh, husband was a carpenter and, and had many great skills with gardening and those kind of things. So essentially for that uh, two year, I guess that 13, 14 months we were apart, I would come down from being a monitor over the weekends and I'd work around the house and he'd teach me how to operate all the heavy machinery and I'd carpentry, I learned, you name it. And uh, that was kind of the deal. So that's kind of how we really bonded and, and met and, uh, and carried on. Um, so uh, I have to recognize the folks from my hometown here today. Now, I've only been back to Salem, Ohio, which is a town of about 12,000, just right near Youngstown, um, right in the Rust Belt, as you would probably call it. And I've only been back there about three times in, I guess you might say, 36 years. So we had about uh, several of them make the trip here today. They're in the audience somewhere. I'm probably going to have to ask them to raise their hands and tell me where they are. Um, there they are, sprinkled around there. Thank you. But Madeline Patton is here. Madeline's uh, husband is the superintendent of Salem City Schools. Madeline's a Harvard grad. Salem is so lucky to have them both. And uh, she also runs a lot of the alumni um, affairs as well for the Salem High School. Um, Pete Thompson and Jim Armini are two of my best friends from mostly playing sports in high school. Um, Mark and uh, Mark and Wendy Salzman um, and Laurie and Ted Hannock are here as well. It's just great to have them here today. They, they go back many, many years. Um, now, while at my last promotion about four years ago, the Commandant uh, General Amos had tried to find some dirt on me so he could pass it to everybody when they promoted me to be a three-star general. And he, he had a way of passing it in a humorous way that he couldn't find any dirt on me. I said, if he was here today, these are the people that can find dirt on me. <laughs> <laughs> bad I did in my school. And some of the stuff wasn't very good, to say the least. <laughs> um, but also, I think Jay St. T is here today. Jay, are you out there somewhere? Jay's here. So, uh, so Jay Santee and I graduated the same year in Little Salem High School. Um, Jay became the Major General in the Air Force. He was the, uh, he's, he was the, he ran the Office of the Secretary of Defense's uh, Space Policy for several years. And then he uh, became the Deputy of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And multi-talented person, he had a lot to do. But he actually put the process together that essentially neutralized all the chemical weapons that were turned in in Syria. And that was all done through Jay. He's here now. And he's from Colorado Springs. They came here, came here all the way today. Um, so after Salem, I went to college at Miami University in Ohio. Several fellow students and graduates uh, that I went to school with are here today. Um, three of them became Marine officers that guided me through uh, school there. Howard Thomas, Mark Whited, and uh, Pat Beekman. They're all out there in the audience today. And uh, they had a lot to do with shaping and molding me through those years. Um, and Pat, I think, is here with his son, uh, Chris, who is a Marine assigned to the uh, Marsan. So it's good to have you here today. Um, the first tour I had in the Marine Corps with, was in the early 80s. And I was kind of mentioned earlier with the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines in Hawaii. Um, there's probably a few Marines out there from 2-3 here today who I served with. Sergeant Tony Brill, are you here today? There he is. So, Second Lieutenant Ruark's first NCO is Sergeant Brill. Sergeant Brill is probably one of the best NCOs in the Marine Corps. And he retired as a major to give you an idea of how far he went. But he was the person that put me on the right path. He could get along with people I couldn't somehow get to do what I wanted them to do. But his way of doing things, his technical expertise was incredible. And thanks for being here today. Jack Mondell, um, are you here as well? Um, so Jack was a, a lieutenant I served with in 2-3. And he was probably the smartest um, officer I've ever run into. And uh, he portrayed, he stayed in four years, and then he, he parlayed that into the Samaritan World at uh, Fannie Mae, where he's worked on IT systems for many, many years, and I think he's about to retire. Charlie Dunstan is here as well. Charlie is a colonel retired. Mary Catherine, he doesn't look a day over, you know, probably about 15 years ago. So Charlie, it's great to have you here. We deployed quite a bit out of two, three. And the boys are here, Major Mike Boyd, and I've worked with several times. Mike, are you here out there? Um, but uh, Mike and his wife have been great vendors for us. And then uh, Rich Stoffer, I don't know if Rich made it today, but uh, there he is. Rich turned over with me in 2-3. Um, but that's the one that really set the foundation for being in the Marine Corps. Um, in the uh, early 90s, I spent four years at Camp of June, North Carolina. And I would call it Camp of June is the correct pronunciation, but I made several deployments there. One of them was with uh, 
then Colonel Hewley, who may be here today as well, uh, Lieutenant General Hewley, and that was probably the best uh, trained Marine Expedition unit I've ever been on and served with in my life. Um, also, was uh, while I was serving in, in Camp Adjourn, um, I saw him out there. Uh, it was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fielder, who was my XO. He's all the way in the back, I think, today. And I learned more from Ed Fielder about logistics than the particularly in combat service support than from anyone. And for Ed, it's just great to have you here today. He, he retired and then became the number two person at the GSA. And I think then he started his own consulting company. So Ed, it's, it's fabulous to have you here as well. Um, so I was at Lejeune and I had the pleasure of working with Colonel Chuck Skipper for about 18 months. And Colonel Skipper uh, taught me how to really be a commanding officer, an executive officer, and also an operations officer. And he was a true mentor in every respect over the years. He pushed me very hard, but uh, he also has been a mentor ever since that time, that time frame to me. And uh, so he is now a professor. He's the department chair for engineering at the Citadel. And he is also here. So Colonel Skipper, if you could there he is. Very up, you look the same. Doesn't change at all. Get some glasses. <laughs> Thank you for making the trip. Um, I had a joint tour of the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Humanitarian Assistance to be mining in 1995. Um, so of note, Dr. Olson initiated several funded programs for the Department of Defense back then in treating blast injuries due to mines and unexploded ordnance. And this was about 1997. Those programs he started, one of them I think was called BRAVA, Blast Resusc Resuscitation and Victims Assistance, would provide a good body of research for use later on for what we encountered in Iraq and Afghanistan. So he had the foresight to see that coming. Um, so after, after the Secretary of Defense's office, I found myself on the West Coast, and I was very fortunate to work for Brigadier General Mark Lott, um, who's also here today. Um, Mark, are you out there? Very good. Yeah, he is. Um, and uh, if there was ever a visionary for logistics, it was he. Um, this is around 1999, 2000, 2001. He foresaw the use of remotely piloted vehicles, Unmanned, air, unmanned aircraft, drones, whatever you want to call them, but for moving logistics. That was what, 17 years ago. So years later, when Lieutenant General Mike Dana and, and General Bro John Broadmeadow uh, were using them in Afghanistan just a couple years ago, um, it all kind of stemmed back to that initial thought. And that's where we're, that's where we're, we're pursuing in the future. That's certainly what commercial industry is trying to do. Um, but it, like I said, working for a visionary was a lot of fun. Because after that, they launched me to uh, Penn State and to study logistics. And while I was there, I was basically uh, um, directed, I think, to do a thesis of some sort. And the person behind that was Greg Johnson. Greg, are you here today? Um, there he is in the back. So Greg was there. Greg's a retired um, 46 pilot. Um, he went to work at the Applied Research Lab at Penn State. And I thought I was just going to get away with a 15-page research paper. But Greg convinced me I had to fulfill a contract with the Marine Corps and do a do a massive study on the, uh, the advanced amphibious assault vehicle, basically to look at maintenance. And Greg's the one who showed me the ropes, took me through the Applied Research Laboratory, showed me how academia um, and the military interact on that and the re what a research institution can do. Um, so Greg, thanks for coming all the way down from State College. I know you're about to retire uh, as well. Um, so finally, uh, um, that got me back to the uh, back to the headquarters of Marine Corps. And so in uh, 2003, after Operation Iraqi Freedom, um, we figured we had we had we were very challenged to execute a uh, I guess a 550 uh, mile move um, through Iraq all the way to uh, basically um, trying to resupply our forces all the way up that pipeline, and we just we just uh, needed to make some massive changes. So the Marine Corps decided we had to make those changes, and so we had to really invest in our education and our processes and our information technology to do that. Our distribution just couldn't keep up. It was nothing like it is today. Um, and so the good news is much of that was already done and, and was being worked in place by people like Colonel Bob Love out there, um, and Ken Laser, who's out here today, and a, and a host of others, and particularly Ron Eckert, who's out there today as well. But uh, so that kind of got me on the, on the logistics modernization aspect where we had to shape it so it would support the battlefield in the future. Um, and I think we're very lucky today to have Lieutenant General Mike Dane as our senior logistician in the Marine Corps who's continuing to follow that trend. Um, what, what got me interested in joint logistics, uh, which I've been doing the last few years, was watching Major General Ken Dow. Ken, are you out there today? Um, Ken may not have made it. But Ken Dow was the, uh, 
uh, was in charge of logistics at the U.S. Central Command, which is in Tampa, that covers the Middle East from 2007 to 10. And uh, he was working for General Petraeus and General Dempsey at the time. But Ken made it very fun. He made it exciting. He was a great communicator. Despite how difficult it was, he was always learning and growing and basically keeping all of the services informed. And, he, and essentially, he had the ability to get all the services and the support establishment to work together. So really, that's what got me interested in it. And lo and behold, in about 2011, that's where I was sent to the U.S. Central Command for two years under General Mattis. And, and essentially, that was, a, it was pretty much an entire logistics evolution. We were closing down one war, moving everything back from Iraq. And then as soon as I got there, an announcement was made was we we're going to do virtually the same in Afghanistan. So for two years, that's what we did, basically plan and execute the retrograde movements. And so I was, and that's where I probably was coined as more of a closer, not an opener. So I'm not the guy that ever got there in the beginning of the conflict. I'm the guy they sent in when it was very mature and time to bring everything back. So that's what I did. I, I basically closed the theaters up and that's for two years there. Um, so that was quite a, uh, that was quite a, a tour there. Um, from there, it was to the Joint Staff. While at the Joint Staff, uh, you can imagine the amount of attention paid to strategy and policy, and also in charting the future of logistics. And it was uh, doing a lot of coalition logistics in support of Afghanistan. And one of those things I wore was a, one of the hats I wore there was the U.S. Rep to NATO, and doing it and really to the Logistics Committee there. So the good news is I got to work with Mr. Estevez, who's seated up here today. And he really helped make things happen in support of that, of all those efforts. And also, we work closely with Major General Jim Richardson. I'm not sure if Jim's out there today. There he is in the back. Jim, it's great to have you back here. Jim was the Deputy Commanding General for Support. And we just had an incredible relationship between Afghanistan and the uh, Joint Staff, and even when I was on CENTCOM before that, and also with Mr. Estevez and OSD. And it was, it was just, a, uh, you know, it was just a, a thrill to do it. Now, part of the fun, I know people don't always talk about the fun, but one of the fun things that happened on the Joint Staff when I was there was that General Dempsey, who was our chairman, um, decided to uh, engage USA Basketball. And uh, now, if you can imagine this, um, if you're an NBA fan, uh, which I certainly am, and there's a lot, of, a lot of us out there, they could not find a general on the Joint Staff to take the teams, the professional teams from the NBA, when they were in town playing the Wizards and usually beating them at the time. Um, they, they didn't have a general volunteer to take these teams around. So I volunteered right away. In fact, they, they stopped asking anybody after I, I took the Wizards around, I took the Rockets around. And, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm on leave in like Arizona with Chris, and we're at a nice spa there. It was one of the best leaves we've ever had. And I get this call, hey, listen, we take the Pistons around on Sunday. We know you're on leave, but will you do it? I said, of course I'll do it. So, I don't know if Chris does like this. <laughs> so they asked me so many questions when I got them in the Pentagon entrance until we got to the press room where I gave the brief. But every picture on the wall, what's a five-star general? You know, how many, how many deployed service members do we have in World War II? Um, you know, what's all the, what are all these ribbons on your chest? I mean, it was just, they wore me out for about two or three hours. And it was incredible. Stan Van Gundy was the coach. And, uh, and then there, there was a legendary trainer for the uh, Pistons, Mike Abenauer. Mike, are you here today? So Mike's in the back. And uh, Mike has been with that team for, I think, 40 years. Mike was a trainer first. Now he's been the director of team operations for several years. He does all the logistics, is what I watch when I see him going around, all the planning, which is pretty significant. So uh, Mike came all the way from Auburn Hills here today, and uh, it's just it's just wonderful experience I had, and it's just it's great to have him and his wife and his son here today. Thanks for being here. Um, so that brings me to my current assignment, and near the end of this, uh, but uh, it's been a uh, I've been assigned back to the office of the Secretary of Defense and Personnel and Readiness. It it was a great period of learning for the last 20 months. Um, while I was there to assist, really, with improving the readiness of the Armed Forces, thanks to Dr. Van Winkle, I think we made a good mark on that. Um, but also, there was a tremendous amount of churn and burn, and I don't even have to talk about this one, with personnel policies. Um, but it takes great people and a great staff to change the compensation policy for retirement, to change accession standards into the Armed Forces, to address religious accommodations, to make changes to long-standing institutions, such as the commissary, to run human resources and maintain the defense manpower data center, and to modify personnel policies that affect 2 million service members active and reserved, as well as 800,000 DOD civilians. So um, that has been an incredible experience. I've worked with some tremendous people, from Under Secretary Levine to Mr. Curla, who's here today, retired uh, two-star admiral in the Navy. 
and uh, the chief of staff for June Penrod. So it was just a wonderful experience. And it was clearly an ideal billet to be in for me to prepare for transition. And I also need to thank General Blockus for his leadership and insight on so many, um, so many different aspects of that and helping me do that. But he's been a great sounding board. Okay, uh, now I can't let the uh, I can't let Father Willis Foster get away here. He gave the uh, indication earlier. Now, Phil Willis Foster is a former helicopter pilot, 46 pilot. We were on deployment. 53. Okay, sorry, 53 pilot. Um, when I was lieutenant, going on many floats uh, out of Hawaii, he was he came in with the HMH, the uh, heavy helicopter squadron. Um, and even though we didn't know each other on ship, I, I recognized his face after two deployments. And then he later became an executive officer for my wife's Marine Wing Support Squadron, and then a commanding officer of the same squadron at New River. And, and then he became my faculty advisor at Joint Command and Staff College in like 1998 for about 12 weeks while he was working on his doctorate. And, and then he followed that by entering the seminary in Alexandria years later to where he is today. So talk about never losing a passion for learning and setting the example when you retire <laughs> to continue moving on. But he's, uh, thanks for being here all the way with your bride and your mother all the way from Petersburg. And that was a real pleasure to have you. So that brings me to my wife. So Chris is an orthopedic physician assistant. Um, she's worked with orthopedic surgeon Dr. Frederick <coughs> Scott the last couple of years. Dr. Scott, are you out there today? Uh, Dr. Scott's in the back. Um, he's married to Dr. Scott, who's also I think, back here too. Um, and for my wife, when she, when she retired from the military, it was not uh, it was not how much money she made or how many hours she worked. It was who she worked for, which has always been the case with Chris. She's found a great person to work for, with Dr. Scott, um, who nothing bothers Dr. Scott. He's an orthopedic surgeon, does nine or ten surgeries at least every Friday, and uh, he's just incredible to work for. We had him here for a parade last summer. But Dr. Scott is just. And Dr. Scott, too, it's just great. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of Chris, it's 26 years of marriage, 29 years of knowing each other, and you still have the spunk and drive and ability to light up any room you're in. Um, thank you for giving me the freedom to transition or pursue work in the future for just about anything or anywhere in my choosing. Uh, Chris once told me a couple of years ago that she didn't want me putting around the house in retirement. Um, well, I, I cannot ever see that happening as every week is an exciting new adventure with her, and it always has been, and it always will be. And with that, I am finished. <laughs>